So we're looking at this controversial passage, which is a controversial uh, chapter, a controversial book, James 2, 17, 18. In the same way, faith by itself, James writes, is, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Wow. Then he raises an objection, but someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without your works, which he says you cannot do. But James rebuts that. And I will show you by my works, my faith. Now, let's go back to where we left off. Where we left off is the phrase, beginning with, so if the majority manuscript evidence of this passage, which we just read, of chorus rendered without is used, which would be correct. Verse 18, it also best fits the context for the preposition chorus without, then the entire verse can be attributed to the objector as is customary with the literary device of an imaginary objector. Show me your faith without your works. Think about that. And I will show you by my works my faith. After which Arthur James responds fully, beginning with you foolish fellow in verse 20. He says, Mr. Objector, Mr. Someone is still not finished yet. So in effect, Mr. Someone is saying to James, you say that faith and works are not are connected. He says, I, I say differently, that faith without works is a dead faith. But I say, show me the kind of faith you have, but without going into what you think, say, or do. But this is, of course, logically is impossible to determine without evidence. And we're not God. And then tell me what that the two are connected. And if you can, and I know you cannot, then I will show you from what I do what I believe in, in an arrogant, prideful, and worthless boast. The text is only correctly understood when the entirety of verses 18 to 19, starting with you have faith, is assigned to the objector, and none of it assigned to James. The view of many writers that James' reply has to begin with at verse 18b ignores the manifest structural signals of James' text, and this, these writers have failed to produce any comparable text in the relevant literature. The objector's statement may be then given as follows, retaining the Greek word order more exactly, but someone will say, You have faith, and I have works. Show me your faith without, chorus, your works, and I will show you from, ek, my works, my faith. The argument which these words express appears to be a reductio ad absurdum. In other words, reducing someone's claims to absurdity. It is heavy with irony. It is absurd, says the objector, to see a close connection between faith and works. For the sake of argument, let's say you have faith and I have works. Let's start there. You can no more start with what you believe and show it to me without your works than I can start with my works and demonstrate what it is that I believe. The objector is confident that both tasks are impossible. Point D, Mr. Summers says that faith and works are not connected. Okay, going a little more deeply. And herein is where Mr. Someone, the objector, uses insufficient context of one's belief and a false analogy of demons versus humans relative to their respective beliefs in one God to maintain their works shed no light on the content of one's faith. He goes too far. He says, much too far. You believe there is one God, Mr. Objector, Mr. Someone says. You do well. So do the demons believe, and they shudder in fear. Mr. Someone, the objector, uses a false analogy of demons versus humans relative to their respective beliefs in one God to falsely maintain their works shed no light on the content of one's faith. Some attributed this verse to James. And not to the objector, but James does not say this. The objector, Mr. Someone does, as we've already established. The objector in verse 19 makes a misguided attempt to build a case for not doing works. He's a lazy Christian. James wouldn't say this because he is on the side of works being performed by the believer in addition to faith. Furthermore, demons cannot be compared to humans relative to this matter. We're not, they're not offered the same that we are as, as humans. They're not offered salvation through Christ. Nor is there enough information relative to the content of the faith of each to make a legitimate comparison. So it is Mr. Someone who says, you believe that there is one God. You believe in monotheism, don't you? You do well, with the implication that some humans who believe in one God 
do good works. Not the case. But then he switches subjects and indicates that demons who believe that there is one God do not behave properly. Even the demons believe that and shudder. Recall that most of James's readership is Jewish, which is intensely monotheistic. They tended to believe that good behavior must be the result of such a belief. Mr. Someone says, but the demons also believe in one God and look at their actions. Totally the opposite from you, they shudder in fear like a bristling dog, evidencing a lack of any relationship with God. So Mr. Someone is saying that what an individual does proves nothing about what he believes and vice versa. Mr. Someone maintains that works shed no light on the content of one's faith. Therefore, Mr. Someone maintains that there is no obligation for a believer to do good works to validate his faith. But there is a vital element in the content of one's belief in one God which demonstrates, determines one's behavior relative to doing well with God or shuddering in fear before God. This element is not present in Mr. Someone's argument, which thereby falsifies it, namely whether or not one believes in the sovereignty of the one true God over one's personal life. Hence, this leaves the belief in one God open to a number of possibilities of behavioral response from outright rebellion and shuddering before God to doing well in friendship and blessing with God. Hence, Mr. Someone's argument is flawed, just as one might believe in the fact that a certain man is a ruler of one's country, but may or may not accept that rule of sovereignty over one, so it is with believing in one God. Furthermore, comparing demons with humans relative to this matter is arguably a false premise, since demons and humans are different, and God has dealt with each group differently. Furthermore, Scripture does not stipulate that angelic beings are held accountable to the doctrines of the faith, or the gospel. Now take another look at this. On the other hand, the rebellious and evil behavior of demons does not contradict what they believe. They believe in one God, all right, but they also believe that God is not sovereign over them, hence they shudder in fear out of rebellion. There you go. Bad argument. He says, you believe there is one God, you do well, so, the do, so do the demons believe, and they shudder in fear. Notice that the imaginary objector attempts to rebut Arthur James by using the examples, example of Christians and demons believing in one God, yet they don't act the same. So he concludes from this, this that works do not prove out what one believes. This is illogical, because believing that there is one God does not necessarily include believing that he is sovereign over one's life. Nor does believing in one God make one a Christian, especially demons who are not offered the opportunity to become Christians. Totally bad argument. So believing in one God does not always lend itself toward doing good works. It is insufficient to conclude anything relative to doing to, to good or bad works. For example, one may believe in one God, but not trust that he is sovereign over one's life. As a matter of fact, Scripture teaches that demons do believe in one God, but also believe that they are not held accountable to God, to God for what they do. As a result, they decide that they can behave any way they want to, and they have, while still maintaining their belief in one God. Hence, they shudder in fear out of rebellion, fearing God's potential reprisal. On the other hand, while one believes in one God and in and in an, his sovereignty over one's life before God, i.e. that one has, was accountable for what one did, then that's, there certainly would be a different behavior pattern resulting in good works. Even for unbelievers, there's a certain amount of relative human good works that a believer who is not trusting alone in Christ alone might do because he, he uh, accepts and believes that God is sovereign over his life. The truth of the matter is that the demon's rebellious and evil behavior does reflect their state of evil rebellion and what they believe. They believe there is one God and tremble in fear, and they believe that they can become like God and usurp his authority. Here's Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, and you have once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit in throne on the mount of the assembly, on the utmost heights, heights of the sacred mountain. I will ascend a Above the tops of the clouds, I will make myself like the Most High. Demonic, Lucifer, the devil. The demons do not believe in one God, in God as their God and worship him, nor trust in Christ for their personal salvation, which offer was never provided for nor made to angelic beings in the first place. They slander against God and man. Their murderous lying and evil ways accurately reflect their rebellious belief system. You belong to your father, the devil, Jesus said. To the Pharisees, and you want to carry out your father's desire? He was a murderer from the beginning, and not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. 1 Tim 4.1 The Spirit clearly says that in latter 
and then in later times, some will abandon the faith and follow deceiving spirits and things taught by demons. Notice that demons may believe in one God, but they are deceivers and murderers and who oppose the doctrines of the faith and God's holiness. Hence, they are rebellious and in direct opposition to believing in the sovereignty of the one God in whom they believe. There is a difference. Bad argument, Mr. Someone. Lack of works does not determine that one's faith is not saving unto eternal life, nor are there degrees of faith such that some who have faith in Christ will not be saved and show it by doing evil. So you believe there is one God, you do well. So do the demons believe, and they shudder in fear. Some interpret this verse to say that there are different kinds of degrees of faith, such that the wrong kind of or insufficient faith in Christ will not provide salvation, eternal life, and evidence itself in evil behavior. Hence they read in verse 219 to say, those who have sufficient faith do well, but the demons who believe do not properly believe and are condemned and look how they behave. They shudder in fear. On the other hand, one must approach the passage from an objective point of view via the normative rules of language, context, and logic. Comparing demons with humans is a false premise, and the demon's belief in one God is not the same as a human believing in Jesus Christ to save one unto eternal life. It is invalid to use such an argument to prove that there are different qualities or quantities of the same faith. So comparing demons with humans relative to this matter is arguably a false premise since demons and humans have a different makeup and God has do dealt with each group differently. Demons have never been offered the chance to believe in the doctrines of the faith or the gospel in order to receive God's grace and salvation to, to eternal life. And salvation unto eternal life. It is also illogical to compare believing in one God with believing in Christ and to eternal life. Even the demons believing that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, exists is not the same as believing that he died for one's sins. The comparisons are not valid. Demons are not offered salvation unto eternal life by believing in Jesus Christ to save them anyway. Nor is believing by anyone in one God, or even that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, exists the same as faith in Jesus Christ unto eternal life. Hence it is invalid to use such an argument to prove there are different qualities or quantities of the same faith, some which save and some which do not. It's the content, the specific stipulations of what you believe in, and not the amount of or a different degree of. There is no distinction as to the kind or degree of faith, only differences as to the content or frequency of what one believes. To express faith is to accept as true a mental assent of whatever that content is. So the normative rules of language, context, and logic do not permit a distinction as to kinds of faith. Faith in something is defined as an acceptance of that something as true, whatever the content of that something is. And if that's the true gospel, you truly have eternal life. There are no degrees of faith relative to believing in someone or something more or less, just as one believes or does not believe that a light will go on once someone flicks a particular light switch. So one believes or does not believe that Christ died for one's sins or not, unto eternal life or not. One cannot by definition falsely believe in something such as falsely believe that Christ died for one's sins. Belief is either on or off. If a belief, if a result is tied to a specific belief, such as belief that Christ died for one's sins unto eternal life, then that result will occur at the moment the belief begins. If it's eternal life, it will never stop. That's the nature of believing. There are only differences in the frequency and content of one's faith not the quality. Fortunately, the gospel requires an instant. Thereafter, you don't believe, you still have eternal life. Because we are fickle people with our sin nature. So expressions of faith <coughs> can be described as varying in accordance with the difficulty of the content of what one believes in, or in the consistency of the same belief over moments of time. <coughs> but never is there a certain degree of kind of faith or kind of faith required in that same content at some moment in time to determine a true versus false belief to bring about a stipulated result. Hence, believing that God will provide food, shelter, and clothing in prosperous times may be described as less difficult to hold to than in, than in hard times, but notice that it is either on or off, or i.e. on more frequently or less frequently. Furthermore, trusting that God will provide, and they go on and off, more frequently over time for some who are more fortunate than others. But a moment of faith alone in Christ alone will always provide eternal life 
For that, from that moment on, by definition, without any further requirements, 